Thank you, Prachi. And uh, let me uh, start by welcoming you to ISAS. Uh, we, as uh, you know, are a multidisciplinary institute. We are part of the NUS, and we also develop as a think tank. And uh, we are very happy to have somebody young and bright like you coming over here and uh, talking to us about uh, what uh, are the findings of your doctoral research. Now, uh, just uh, by way of introduction, you know that we are a sort of collection of specializations over mm -hmm. here. And your work uh, from the little discussions that uh, we have had earlier is a very intensive, technical, rigorous exercise of enormous uh, research value. Uh, just keep in mind the fact that we are a kind of a mixed bunch of people yes. and we would be very happy to take in as much of your you know high-tech research as uh, as we can and I think this is an extremely important subject because while I will not get too much into the details of what exactly you have done which is going to come out I think this is a, a very a different study of Indian manufacturing because Indian manufacturing typically has been struggling with this question of uh, how much of productivity advances it has made over time. Uh, there have been a lot of static analyses of the labor productivity, capital productivity and the productivity which comes after taking away labor and capital which is mostly out of technology and innovation and which in literature is referred to as the total factor productivity. And uh, th there are many Indian economists who have been specializing in this particular work. But the interesting part about what Prachi has done here is that not only has she looked at a bunch of industries which are uh, very important from a policy perspective in the sense that all of them are part of this Make in India basket, but also the fact that uh, she has actually looked at, picked up data at the plant level and try to study productivity across a cross-section of industries at the plant level, which obviously being a very different kind of uh, insight into this whole research. So uh, with that, Prachi, let me just very briefly share with this uh, audience that you, are, you, you have submitted your doctoral thesis at the yes. Indira Gandhi Institute for Development Research, Mumbai. Uh, she has been working with uh, her supervisor is Professor Viramani, again, a well-known expert on the subject of trade and monetary economics and industrial development in India. Prachi's thesis has been on the uh, impact of trade reforms on uh, productivity growth and markups in India's manufacturing sector. She has been with the IG IDEA from before her PhD. She's an MSc in uh, economics uh, from IG IDEA. It's now an in university, isn't it? Yeah, IG IDEA is a, a deemed, yes, deemed, deemed a university. Deemed. Right. So she holds an MSc in economics from IJIDR and uh, uh, a graduate degree from uh, LSR in Delhi, Lady Sri Ram College. And she also worked as an assistant manager with Deloitte Huskins and Cells Mumbai. And right now I think she's in Singapore. You've yes. moved to Singapore. Yes. Right. So we hope to see more of you in our activities and uh, engage more of you down the line. So with that you go. 40 minutes, 35 right. to 40 minutes. I'll warn you before you reach yes. the margin on that, okay. please. Okay. Thank <coughs> you. Thank you, Dr. Amit Indu, for the introduction and giving me this opportunity to present my work here. And thank you, everyone in the audience, for taking your time to attend this seminar. Uh, so I, as, uh, yeah. as Professor and Dr. Amit Indu mentioned, uh, this is a part of my doctoral research that I recently submitted. So that, uh, uh, t the title for today's presentation is Trade and Productivity Growth Analysis of Indian Manufacturing Plants. So let's start with the essential question of you know, why manufacturing and why productivity. So, well, history suggests that one of the most certain paths to economic growth has been export-oriented industrialization. Whether it was uh, Great Britain during Industrial Revolution or U USA after World War II or in the recent times China since the 1980s. So the large capacity of the manufacturing sector to absorb the surplus labor that moves out of the agricultural sector, which is, so this labor is essentially very low skill labor. So the large capacity of the manufacturing sector to absorb this labor is seen as a key channel to increase per worker productivity in the economy. So basically you're increasing the productivity of the uh, uh, per worker productivity in the economy and hence generate long-term economic growth. Now, India's policymakers uh, since independence have stressed on the need to expand manufacturing sector. As early as 1956, which was in the second uh, five-year plan that they established, they set out 
La rapid industrialization as one of the key uh, policy objectives of uh, India's economic planning. Uh, let's fast forward and come to the present time. So, uh, what has happened to India's economic growth? Uh, as we are all aware, it's, it has been driven by the service sector, and the share of manufacturing sector has remained stagnant for almost two decades, between 14 to 16 percent. Uh, in wake of this, recently the government uh, launched a couple of programs like the new manufacturing policy in 2011, which aims at expanding this share from 16% or 14% to 25% as the target and generate 100 million jobs. And the very recent and very talked about, the Make in India campaign, which aims to transform India into a global manufacturing hub, just like China, has, um, has been set out by the recent government. So there has been an emphasis in the pol uh, am amongst the policymakers to expand the manufacturing sector. So uh, let's ask the question, okay, so we want the manufacturing to, uh, sector to expand, so how do we m um, get the growth in the manufacturing sector? What are the factors that can lead to this growth in manufacturing sector? So there are two factors, essentially, which can generate growth in the manufacturing sector. So first is uh, capital accumulation which basically means that you know you put in more and more capital into your production processes and you can have greater and greater output growth uh, but this this channel is sort of restrained by the principle of uh, diminishing returns which we call in economics which basically means that uh, the more and more capital you employ in your production processes the subsequent gains in your output growth will be lesser and lesser and this is the neoclassical economics that says uh, Okay, so that basically means that there is a limit to how much you can grow using this channel. So the second channel that can contribute to productivity growth, uh, so, so manufacturing growth, is productivity. So let's ask, okay, what is productivity? In very simple terms, productivity would mean uh, the efficiency with which you put in resources to produce an output, put in inputs to produce an output. Or if I want to say it a little more technically, it would mean that uh, change in output that is not explained by change in inputs. Now how? So just imagine a case where you're using, suppose, two units of labor and one unit of capital to produce uh, an output of x, x units. Uh, now some magic happens in the system, and then again, two units of labor and one unit of capital is producing x plus one units of output. So this growth in output can be termed as productivity. So the question is, okay, what, 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 what is this magic? What, what, what can it be? Anything like, for example, a technological progress or a process innovation, just to quote. So, uh, and, uh, and more, uh, if I want to just say mathematically in a line, it would be, in, if you remember a Cobb Douglas production function, uh, then the capital A, uh, which is uh, uh, in the Cobb Douglas production function, even if you are not able to recall a Cobb Douglas production, it's okay because it just might facilitate the future discussion. So, uh, the total factor productivity, which is basically a rise in this capital A in the Cobb Douglas production function, leads to a simultaneous rise in both the marginal outputs of labor as well as capital. So, all fa factors start performing better because of this shooting up of A. So, this is what, uh, and hence the name total factor productivity or multi factor productivity, because all factors are now doing better because something has happened in the system. So, economists across domains have sort of agree to the fact that productivity is a key determinant of long-run economic growth. To quote Krugman in this context, he says, okay, depressions, runaway inflation, civil wars can make a country poor, but only productivity can make it rich. And, and uh, a very common, another one by Krugman is, uh, productivity is anything, but you know, in, in the long run, it is almost everything. So <coughs> having uh, discussed why manufacturing and why productivity, uh, and that productivity is important. Let's ask the next question. Okay, so if productivity is so important, what are the factors that drive productivity? Let's see a few examples here. So, a few examples are like some, some sort of technological innovation, a new tech technology, uh, for example, the internet, uh, which, was, uh, which increased uh, productivity across sectors manifold. Uh, a process innovation, a very good example of this could be <coughs> Henry Ford's idea of you know moving assembly line. Uh, with the same uh, pr uh, in input, with the same labor and capital, the, man the car uh, uh, industry was able to produce five additional cars in the same time, just because they, were, they had invented a different pr pr process of uh, assembling things together. As the car was moving along the assembly line, you are sort of um, putting up the car together. And uh, other institutional factors, such as uh, uh, which increase uh, transparency, accountability, competition in the market, literature that identified, identified that such channels can generate productivity growth, such as better contract enforcement, better law and order situation in a country and all that. So let's come to trade now. 
uh, empirical evidence with respect to the impact of trade on productivity is very mixed. So several studies have analyzed this uh, linkage, like what has happened to, uh, to productivity growth in economies when they were opened up to trade, and they find varying uh, uh, results. Like Tibu for Chile finds that there was a negative growth in productivity, but Fernandez for Colombia finds that, okay, it was very good. Similarly, in case of Indian manufacturing, there are a plethora of studies and they all have different uh, predictions. Some say uh, it was very good, some say it was nothing, some say it was uh, bad. So, um, so there is a lot of um, uh, mixed empirical evidence and we don't know exactly what is it that is happening in the scenes that, that is generating this uh, mixed evidence. So <coughs> this study tries to uh, like fill that gap in literature. Uh, so, and that's why, uh, okay. So, so by this uh, slide we have discussed why manufacturing, why productivity and why trade is important here. Let's move to the next slide. Let's ask the question, okay, uh, so now we want to understand the impact of trade on productivity. So let's first theoretically understand the channels through which uh, literature says that trade should increase productivity. And then we will empirically see, okay, how th these channels operate. So now trade can impact productivity at two levels in an economy. One is at an aggregate level, which is an industrial level, like a group of plants operating within uh, an economic boundary or geographical boundaries like an industry, which is an aggregate level. And it can also drive productivity at a disaggregate level. So one would say, okay, how is, how is it different? It's just accumulation of plants and a single plant here. So while the channels are different through which trade competition and tra trade can generate productivity ones at these two levels, and it's important to study uh, both of them. So let's discuss the first channel, which is the aggregate level gains. Now when an economy is open to trade, what happens is uh, <clears throat> there is rise in competition in the domestic market. Most productive firms expand and l less productive firms sort of start shrinking and exiting because you know they're not able to sustain the increased competition, increase in wage rates that the labor is demanding now because more productive firms have entered the market. So this, this sort of starts exiting, uh, shrinking and exiting. So just this dynamism of exit of least productive plants and expansion of the most productive firms, plants generates a productivity growth. Even if there is no plant level gains, the single plant has not gained its productivity, but just because the least productive just went out of the market, the aggregate productivity of the industry sort of rose. So these are the predictions of the Millet's model, and, and he terms this thing as a market share reallocation from uh, least productive plants to most productive plants. So this is the first channel. And the second channel is at the disaggregate level, when, where each plant is trying to get better because of increased competition and because of exposure to trade. And uh, the channels that could operate through this is pro-competitive effect, like because now I'm facing greater competition in the market, I'm a plant, and uh, I'm trying to say, okay, let me try to become, I'll try to become more efficient, I'll try to reduce slack in the production processes, I'll identify which are my key uh, uh, products, you know, wherever I'm doing good, and like sort of discard the unprofitable ones try to get become more efficient. And then there are technology spillovers because now advanced in products are entering my domestic economy. Uh, even I, don't, I do not have that uh, uh, R&D base to uh, sort of uh, invent things. But when these things come into the domestic market from advanced countries, I can sort of break them and reverse engineer them and see that, OK, this is the new technology. Let me put it. So this is what they call technology spillovers. Can sure, sure. Oh no, so uh, there is a slight difference here. It can be, the predictions can be the same, but plant is basically manufacturing factory, a factory. A firm can be a group of factories. So like uh, Reliance can have different plants, but here I'm tracing each plant. Okay, so say, I'm just yes, yes, please. Because, yes, exactly. Exactly, yes. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. And uh, within the firm, there's this aggregation, so... Uh-huh. So, uh, Why wouldn't you be... I so mean, how, how do you recognize looking at a firm that is just adding a little bit of value to the entire product? I mean, that may not be entirely... I'm also thinking from the data point of view. Mm-hmm. So, uh, um, basically, even if I'm, sp I'm a big firm and I'm splitting a uh, production across my plants, yeah. and I'm just trying to see exactly what is happening in the economy where the production is happening. So this is a complete product. Yes. Honda has got several factories in Maharashtra. Yes. Yeah, so each factory. Yeah, so each, factory each factory is a data point. homogeneous product, the entire product in that case. Yeah, so That's if Honda is producing... One part where the windshields and the chassis being assembled. 
Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. I I don't think the predictions will change, but maybe I can discuss that. Uh, as uh, yeah yeah. So I uh, yeah. So I I don't think the predictions of the model will change, but this basically is I'm identifying uh, I'm tracing each plant that is producing a particular product. So okay. So <coughs> these are the two levels. So in my research, I've I analyzed and measured these two uh, channels at uh, at the uh, productivity gains at both the levels. But in this presentation, I'll just uh, uh, restrict to the I'll discuss only the first level of gains, which is the aggregate level gains through market share reallocations. So let's begin with the. Sorry. So uh, we have identified the channels through which we are expecting. Uh, I've mentioned that we, I'm just analyzing the first channel, which is aggregate level gains. So let's establish the research questions for this presentation. What are the questions that we will address in this uh, presentation? So we asked that, do we have evidence uh, that trade liberalization that happened in the Indian economy generated aggregate productivity growth through market share reallocations in the Indian manufacturing sector? And as you might be aware that India's manufacturing sector is spread across various states. There, uh, various states have different uh, manufacturing plants, and these uh, and these states are very heterogeneous in terms of the institutional factors, like, like such as uh, the credit markets, the financial uh, infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, uh, and the labor markets. So the next question that I, the uh, related question that I ask is okay. So uh, first, the question is that uh, did trade lead to market share reallocations and generated aggregate productivity? And were these gains influenced by differences in institutions? You know, plants which were operating in states with better in, in institutions, were they doing better? Or whether it was just same for everybody? So the, these are the two basic questions that I'm trying to address here. What is the data? So the data for this study is, uh, the period of analysis is uh, uh, what I call the second decade of reforms in India, which is 1998, 99 to 2007, 8. Uh, why second decade? I'll discuss that uh, uh, later. Um, the production data, or the plant level data, is, has been obtained from the annual survey of industries. Uh, annual survey of industries is conducted by the Ministry of uh, Statistics and Program, Program Implementation, which is called MOSPEAK. It's a government of India ministry, yes. So uh, now ASI conducts uh, it, uh, this survey in two parts. One is a census, census sector, and another is a sample sector. So census sector has basically, it uh, comprises of all the large manufacturing plants. And uh, large basically is defined as uh, those plants which are employing greater than 100 laborers or workers in the production processes. And the ASI uh, surveys these plants on a year-on-year -year basis continuously. So <coughs> And the next, uh, and the second uh, uh, subset is the, the smaller plants which are employing less than 100. They fall under the sample sector, where I sample sort of representative plants uh, and uh, survey them. So, uh, and it's based on a random sample, and then I estimate, okay, what are the aggregate uh, uh, indicators saying using multipliers. So uh, for this study, because I wanted to trace each plant uh, as, it, uh, as the economy was opening to trade over this period of 1998, 2007, I needed a, uh, a neat uh, continuous data set which only a census sector can provide me because all the plants in this sector are surveyed year on year, every year. So I use the census sector. So you might have to bear in mind that so the, uh, the findings might be influenced because they are, uh, are more pertinent for plant, uh, large pl ma ma manufacturing plants in India. What would it be for the smaller manufacturing plants? Uh, I will not be able to probably uh, generalize that very easily from this study. Uh, now, ASI data does not provide you, you information on the trade participation of the plants. Say, how much tariffs were they say, uh, paying, or how much, uh, uh, where were they importing from, how much they were importing, how much were they exporting. So this sort of data, uh, I use uh, industry-level data, uh, data from uh, various sources such as WTO, Com, Trade, UNCTAD, depending on the level of aggregation, disaggregation I need. And uh, as I'm also uh, uh, understanding the state level impact of state level controls, that data has been obtained from CMI and uh, Government of India websites. So I'll discuss these variables in detail in the for future slides. So let's see what happened to. Now we have discussed what was the data. We move to the next section of this uh, presentation, where I will just. Sorry. Where I'll just discuss uh, the. Uh, the trends in uh, <coughs> the trade. No, so I just assume because I don't have that information. So I just assume that if a plant is operating in an industry which is very actively uh, participating, so you just assume that okay, these factors will sort of influence them. Yeah. 
So uh, what happened to the tariff rates in India? So we know that uh, India started liberalizing its economy in 1991, where uh, tariff rates were started to uh, 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 were, were <coughs> reduced. Uh, over the first decade, which is from 1990 to 1991, there was a large reduction in tariff rates from 81% for the manufacturing sector to almost 33% in 1999. So this is a large, large reduction. But uh, some authors like to call this period as there was a lot of water in tariffs, which basically means that even if you, you reduce tariffs from 100% to say 50%, it's still exorbitantly high to uh, for the domestic producers to compare it with the domestic prices. So th they will say that, oh, this is too expensive. I can't import right now. So the even if you reduce to 33%, the uh, trade uh, participation did not really pick up that much in the Indian economy. And why do I say so? Because there is a study by Viramani, uh, Virmani, sorry, uh, Arvind Virmani, 2002. So he ranked like 122 countries uh, on the ba on the scale of uh, you know uh, uh, how open uh, the manufacturing sectors were based on the tariff rates that they had imposed. And he ranks India as 120, 120th, just above Cambodia and Pakistan. So he says that okay, Indian economy in the first decade was still very close as compared to international standards. Come the next decade, which is I call the second decade of reforms, uh, Indian economy started, like uh, policymakers and industrialists started gaining confidence in their performance in the uh, international front. And uh, policies were rationalized across board during this period. And by 2007, the rates were reduced to as low as 9%. And uh, in this context, Purcell says that uh, if I rank uh, India now, uh, I would say that it's a low protection sector for the manufacturing by global standards. So we can say that in the second decade of reforms, there was a lot of opening that happened, which uh, and which is also uh, reflective in the trade participation numbers that India went through. So first decade of reforms, the trade growth was year on year uh, around 10%, and it almost more than doubled for the second decade of reforms. Import growth was 24.2% annually, which is year on year, and export growth was like around 20.2%. So there has been a lot of dynam dynamism in the second decade, and which is why we're looking at this period, which looks interesting to us. Uh, this is just a quick. Uh, industry statistics because productivity is basically you measure inputs you and you measure outputs so it just gives you an aggregate uh, view of you know what was happening in the tra what what were the trends in the output and input front so we see that there is a lot of growth in output gross output and net value added especially in the last two uh, sub periods and there is an equal uh, a, a large growth in the capital that has been uh, used in the productions uh, fixed capital includes inventories as well no, it doesn't. Only the fixed Yes, numbers. only the fixed And plant and machine. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, labor, labor, increase in labor is a marginal, a negative also for two sub-periods. It picked up in the last two sub-periods, uh, sub but not as high as capital. So it's sort of an indicated that, okay, India has uh, sort of uh, uh, moved uh, uh, on the path. One, one clarification. Mm -hmm. When you say growth rates in workers. Yes. What do you exactly mean? This is the number of workers that plants are using, or mm -hmm. is it in wages and salaries? No, no, no. It's the number. Number it's of workers. It's the total number. Oh. And these growth rates is the it's the year on year change that was happening. Year on year change is one point five. Mm -hmm. What exactly does that mean? So it's like I basically estimated a s I smoothened log uh, exponential regression for this period. So this is a coefficient. Yes. So missing. Basically, during that period, you find a positive coefficient on that, right? Yes, 1. yes, 5. yes. Okay. Yes. So, so there has been a capital-intensive growth uh, mm -hmm. in the output. So let's start yeah, with. I'm not sure if I'm going to get to the methodology. Yes. Now the oh, next wow. is there. Yes. Yeah. So now the third section where I discuss. Okay. What is what does the Indian literature say? So, <coughs> Indian literature. Uh, there are. Uh, uh, two kinds of studies in, uh, on India and productivity. First are uh, the descriptive studies, which su just see the trends, okay, did whether, whether productivity increased or decreased, and they compare the 80s with the 90s and 2000s. Most of the studies on an average find that in the 90s, in the 90s as compared to the 80s, uh, productivity sort of fell. There was a deceleration in productivity in the first decade of reforms. And the studies that compare the 90s with the 2000s, on an average, find that okay, to, uh, productivity growth picked up in the 2000s as compared to the 1990s. So this is what the descriptive findings say. Now the second uh, part of studies are which try to understand and correlate the impact of trade. Uh, okay, it's reduced or it increased. Did trade cause this increase or decrease? Yes or no. So again, the empirical evidence is very mixed. Some studies say no impact. Some studies say yes, positive impact. So let's uh, try to 
un understand what could be the reason that there is so much mixed evidence, you know, they're un so sort of looking at the same issues and why are they finding such conflicting results. So, uh, Actually, are any of these studies on the plant level? Uh, no, no, no. Plant level no. is the, but there are, there are a few studies on the firm level. Firm level, the Balakrishnan et al. is the. So uh, yeah. A firm producing or a factory producing a exactly. composite mm -hmm. product, because otherwise you're, you're opening up more than a can of worms. Mm -hmm. uh, how you will collate uh, the, the productivity within the different plants. So I'm taking plant as mm -hmm. a factory. Yes, right. which is producing Rather one product. Something that's producing the entire product. You may have um, General Motors and many factories. Mm -hmm. But has got a bunch of mm -hmm. factories across mm -hmm. the country as the two leaders say. Exactly. The data is looking at Dibinde, you are absolutely correct. I think wh what has happened here is it, she's using the ASI data. ASI goes by the Factories Act of 1948, right. which has this registered enterprises, and whether they assemble mm -hmm. or do part line production, they call them plants, factories and plants. Oh, okay. yeah. But that's a serious limitation of data, what you're pointing right. out. It, it doesn't correspond to the theory. So in a sense, I think, firms are actually the more holistic organized concept to be taken up from the literature but there is a problem in the way the data comes out in the ASI but, but your point is absolutely valid I think that's the point which you should take uh, note of I'm sorry uh -huh. interrupting you because we are reverting to the economic no, absolutely. Interesting. Yes, yes. Yes. Well, the business school where yeah. traditionally we wait till yes. the end yeah. of the seminar <laughs> No, no, I'm, I, I'm absolutely happy to follow that pattern. I think that's that's much better. Absolutely. You have the chair's double permission. You the So let me just uh, come back to the fir first the firm versus the plant. So there is there is also a problem if I use the firm level data. Like you know, there are databases like Provis. But firms can be producing a lot of products. Uh, right, and then if I estimate production function at that level of aggregation, where I'm uh, suppose there is a startup which is producing textiles and cars together, and this all data is sort so of collated. Yes, yes, exactly, it exactly. It demarcates that product, so I have a better uh, estimation of production function because I'm not estimating the same production function for textiles and cars, right. sort of. So what, what level of it's uh, at the NIC level uh, up to five digit disaggregation. Uh, so it's an industrial classification, industrial classification. So uh, I'll just come to the two digit, which is basically okay. food, food products. And within two digit, then it'll be like what sort of food products. And so it goes into like fifth digit category, which is like a lot of disaggregation. So I can trace t till that level. But I, the productivity that I estimate is I use it at two, di two digit because th there are very few plants otherwise in the five digit. And I can't estimate things very pro properly. So. Uh, so the, uh, why is the mixed evidence? Uh, there could be three reasons which I identify from literature. One is uh, Virmani and Hashim again say that, okay, there could be a J-curve hypothesis, you know, because uh, as you uh, open up uh, and firms are exposed to trade or plants are exposed to trade, they sort of start to restructure, you know, discard old processes, get buy in new capital, make some sort of changes. And because of this, they could, this period could, uh, uh, Image, the period that immediately follows trade reforms, firms can uh, or plants can uh, reduce their productivity because they're trying to make these adjustments. So there could be a small slowdown in the growth, and then the growth is expected to pick up. So maybe that is why 90s was lesser, and then 2000s the growth picked up. Then Golda suggests that uh, the first decade of reforms there was a. Uh, you know, there were a lot of pa parallel uh, reforms that were in place in the in economy. There were industrial reforms that were happening, banking sector, financial sector, trade. So if you want to sort of segregate the impact of trade from this, it, it is very difficult to uh, do it properly, properly or uh, be very sure about, you know, what you have disaggregated is because of trade or because of industry or because of banking sector reforms or something. So he says that, okay, if you, uh, but in the second decade of reforms, mm, yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, uh, yes. The removal of interest rate controls. So mm -hmm. There are proxies or uh, uh, instrumental variables that you could use to filter those out. True. Uh, and that's also going to have a homogeneous effect across yes. the entire yes. sector. Yes, yes. But then I cannot be sure whether so now. Yeah. Too much over that. Mm -hmm. so okay. It should be services sector, isn't it? Banking, like, you're comparing this with the black. No, the 
access to finance. Access to industrial credit. Industrial credit, yeah. So then Golda suggests that you know second decade of reforms is like a sort of calmer period and more distinct trade reforms and increased trade participation. That said, that could be a more appropriate period to analyze. Uh, and the third limitation of the existing studies is they, they see, okay, what happened to trade and what happened to productivity, but they forget to link it with the mis uh, this th channel in between market share reallocations or technology spillovers. So uh, this study so sort of fills in that gap and analyzes them, first measures the channels and then analyze, okay, did these channels were caused by, were these channels caused by trade? And then we can say that, okay, if these channels impacted productivity, trade impacted these channels, or trade impacted productivity, something like that. So let's come to the methodology now. Uh, Sorry, I think a bit of a test. Yes, no, 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 not at all, please. Um, you know, no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Market share is an outcome. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not something that's endogenous. It's an outcome of uh, shifting competitiveness, right? Uh, why, why are you endogenizing? I mean, what do you so, uh, endogenizing that? Because uh, there is a lot of dynamics that is happening. So most productive firms are expanding. Right. So y yes. Yes. Heroes. Yes. Or, 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 sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Mondal do better. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's just a natural outcome of. So exactly. So I'm trying to see. Yeah. So I'm trying to see. Did trade cause this dynamism? Were the most productive firms able to expand? And uh, most. So you're looking at trade. Because yes. Sort numbers as well. Yes, exactly. So I'm trying to see when uh, uh, this economy was open to trade. Was, what was the dynamism that happened? Did the most productive firms expand easily, and did trade cause this dynamism? Okay, a priori, we know the answer to that. Right? So you're filtering out. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're filtering out because many of the components are imported as well. For the automobile sector, for instance, yes, which is yes. a major sector that will affect yeah. more than other manufacturers. Mm -hmm. There's a huge amount of I mean, early days of just mocked down kits, right? They're just putting them together. Yes. Um, and then they make conditions about having more and more indigenously manufactured uh, uh, components. Shifting market shares within the domestic market and the international market. No, only domestic. So you're not looking at export figures? No, not because uh, here, uh, sorry, the market share basically means the domestic market share. I'm not looking at the, the international market share because so these are domestic firms producing, producing domestically market. and uh, sort of, so, okay, so I'll just discuss this when I've come to the decomposition, you might get a better idea. So let's come to the data, what do I do? So I have this big data of uh, uh, plants uh, in the ASI, the 10 year data I have for each plant, I can track each plant. Some plants exit ex uh, or enter new plants. That so it's an how big is the data in terms of number of observations? So uh, the census data that I have is around 70,000 plants for 10 years. Seven zero. Yes. There were a lot more, but I had to f uh, clean the data a lot because you know there was uh, the 70,000 uh, observations. This is across how many industries? 70. Uh, so 36 major manufacturing 36 industries. At the two digit level. At the two digit level. So sorry, 36, no, 15. 15 manufacturing industries. 15, um, so. Okay, I mean, yes, so yes. Okay, so what do I do? I have this data, uh, a plant level data, where I see what are the plants producing, how, what are the inputs, what are the in, uh, uh, output, how much. And um, I s uh, sort of estimate a Cobb Douglas production function using an econometric technique. And I estimate uh, plant level productivity. So for each plant, for each year, I have this productivity number for each plant. Uh, the next step is I move on to estimate the aggregate productivity. So how do I estimate aggregate productivity? Now I have plant level productivity. So the first step is I have to define an industry at what level am I aggregating. It could be at, uh, at a, at a two-digit industry level or at a two-digit within a state industry level. So uh, aggregate productivity is defined as a weighted average of plant level productivities in an industry. So clearly, uh, and what is the weight? It is the market share in the output in, of the industry. So PIJT is the plant uh, plant J, which is operating in industry I at time T, and its equivalent share in that given industry. And I sort of weight this and uh, t take a sum. So I get an est estimate of aggregate productivity, which is the weighted productivity across all plants. So the our question was, what has happened to the market share reallocations? So let's split, uh, d decompose this uh, productivity into two components and see what happens next? 
So what I do is uh, uh, I sort of uh, decompose this uh, aggregate productivity, which is summation SIJT, PIJT. You don't have to get into the numbers. I'll just uh, put it more uh, <coughs> verbally. I decompose into two components. Now, one component is simple productivity, which is a simple average of productivity across all plants in an industry. So imagine there is this industry which has a lot of plants. I just take a simple mean, an unweighted mean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. And extracting productivity uh, differences. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's again a bit of a can of worms. Um, mm -hmm. control, in Singapore, there was a huge controversy I see. over a couple of papers which said it was entirely labor and uh, capital grown rather than innovation. Uh, um, to DFP increases. Can, can you run through the methodology and what made you adopt the method that you did? Even if you look at Jorgensen's work, uh. and it's on the earliest, and it's mm -hmm. there's a huge amount of innovation in that. Mm -hmm. And Milit says, exactly. I just danced at it actually. Yeah. I'm not very familiar with this. Okay, area. okay. Uh, again, that's improvised. Could you just talk through? Uh, so I'm, I'm not able to understand what do you okay, want me to do. The measurement of productivity, how's that? Uh, so how did I measure productivity? And what was the model that you used? Oh, I, so I'll just come to those numbers if you want to. Uh, so how are you oh, asking the, the me that? Intuition, the intuition. How did you yeah. choose this method first? Mm -hmm. And maybe a bit more detail on each of those components, which are getting into the measure of the productivity that you So there are two things. Firstly, why did I choose a diff certain method to estimate productivity? So that is basically going to the technical details. So I use this levinson petrin technique of estimation of productivity. Now productivity can be estimated in different ways. There could be growth accounting, there could be uh, data envelopment analysis, and there could be econometric estimation, uh, which is basically you are estimating a Cobb Douglas production function. Now the problem is that um, there's a problem of endogeneity when you econometrically estimate productivity. What happens is I'm a plant manager. I know that I have a very productive plant, so I will sort of increase my production, I'll choose inputs in a way that, because I know that there is this pro positive productivity shock that I, I'm experiencing, so I'll put in more inputs that, okay, I want to produce more because I have a positive pl uh, out productivity output. But because of this, there is a problem of endogeneity. Is it this what you're trying to? No, no, just, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, very roughly that, but that's intuition not going to hold out if you're getting uh, an incentive of fraud from increasing competitiveness or now that the barrier for Yeah, exactly. So this, this is going to be cost reduction. The managers have to become progressively better. Yes, yes. Better. And it, that will show in the productivity numbers whether it happened or not yeah. happened. That's the intuitive part. I, mean, I was just asking mm -hmm. about the particular method of decomposition. This is econometric. Yes. Not, you don't know, mm -hmm. doesn't tell you anything mm -hmm. uh, about this. Mm -hmm. Or not as growth accounting for the for firm level data. Using econometric. Techniques yeah, okay. So I was just asking for uh, what specific method are you using? I see. So, okay. So, the method that I've used for estimation of productivity is a semi parametric uh, estimation method, which is called Levinson and Petrin technique. It was a paper they published in 2003 and was published in AER, and then uh, it, so it became sort of a, uh, a very good method to estimate productivity if you have a plant uh, panel data so that you can trace plants uh, or firms. Then, next, we move on to estimating aggregate productivity and then splitting it up into these two components which is market share reallocations and simple productivity. Now the technique that is used here is Ole and Packis technique. There are certain other techniques as well, which can uh, sort of uh, measure uh, entry and exits, you know, whether exiting plants were more productive or exi uh, entering, entering plants were more productive. But that sort of dynamism is missing in the census data because there's uh, essentially large plants which are sitting there. So there is not much exit. So I, and this me method was more simpler to use, so I resorted to Ole and Packis technique for decomposing because it gives me a clear idea of how markets, uh, market shares are changing and how productivity is changing. And that number is very intuitive and clearly understood through this technique of decomposition. So you'll get uh, that uh, uh, intuition probably when I discuss this formula and why, da why did I choose this formula. Now see the second, second part. So the first part is uh, a simple average productivity across uh, all plants in an industry, which is PIT bar, which is a very boring number. 
the second number, the second part is the interesting bit. It is, it is basically a distribution of productivity. Now, what is it? Now, imagine there is this plant J, Mr. J. He has a productivity uh, level which is very high. He is, he's like a super performer, and his productivity is more than the average productivity in the industry, which is PIT bar. So he says, oh, okay, I'm very productive. And he also sees that, oh, I have a market share, which is SIJT, Mr. J, has a market share which is also greater than the average market share that the producers own. So Mr. J, who is very good, very productive, has also a market share which is very good, which is higher than the average. Come next year, Mr. J increases his productivity further. So he says, oh, I'm even more productive now as compared to last year. So the second bracket is sort of greater than the previous year. And if this uh, Mr. J uh, is able to expand his market share again more, then this, this first term will also be positive. So if a more productive plant, Mr. J, is sort of a, uh, able to expand his productive uh, market share, this, sec this, this term will be positive. Now imagine a case where Mr. J is sick. The plant is doing very bad and he says that, that oh, I'm performing very bad and it's, uh, my productivity is lesser than the industry average. So what I want to do is, I so this is negative, the second bracket is negative because J's productivity is less than the plant uh, average industry productivity. So the second term is negative. But the first term, he says that, okay, I, w I don't want to serve this big market, I want to exit. But there is something that is holding him or it. So, it, uh, so which basically ma makes the f uh, first term, which is the difference between its market share, which has remained strong and uh, it has to cater to that market, is not able to exit. It's greater than the average. So this term will become negative then. A plant which is poor uh, performing and it's not able to reduce its market share uh, and it, it has to sustain that market share or uh, so it will generate a negative market re reallocation in that term. PIT is your productivity, right? PIT is my productivity. Aggregate. So now, if, mm -hmm. if I'm a new firm entering the market, yes. I have not been there before. So uh, according to this one, I said in the second term that you have mm -hmm. under summation, the first term would be negative. The first term, yeah, because I'm a small it's plant. Negative, yes. But say I'm very productive. Yes. So the second term is positive. Yes. But my productivity would be less than the average productivity of the industry. Then that will be negative as well. I'm just wondering if. So, so yeah, exactly. Way to, uh, oh. Categorize my productivity. Mm, so I'm productive mm, since my market share is, is low, less. Exactly. I'm coming out to be a much less productive firm. So, uh, yes. So now you have to think in the next year what happens to you. You were more productive. Were you able to That's expand? A I'm talking about this time because uh, there's no T minus one term. But you have to uh, see this as uh, you know time is moving from one to two. Then you can see that if more productive firms are expanding in the next year and less productive firms are contracting, then this number will become bigger positive. That's okay. But at a given point in time, mm -hmm. although I am more productive than the yeah, firms, yes. my productivity would come out to be lesser in this case. Your contribution to productivity, yes. Okay, okay. Yes, but if the market is allowing you to expand next year, then it's it will sort of capture that, okay, you were more productive and you, you sort of increased your market share as well. So it will say that, okay, the market was... Uh, yeah. Prachi, just in the interest of time and also not to exhaust you too much, uh -huh. I suggest that in the next 15 minutes you just wrap up, uh, okay. take us through the results. Mm -hmm. we, we will hold back our pot shots till you finish okay. and you can be sure that we will have a lot. <laughs> so maybe these 15 minutes will keep quiet and just let you run through. Okay. Go ahead. So here are the numbers. <laughs> yes. So here are the numbers of uh, what uh, what is the aggregate productivity and this is basically the whole manufacturing in, in, just in, in Indian manufacturing sector. So I put in all the plants that are operating in the Indian, Indian manufacturing sector together and see what has happened to the aggregate manufacturing productivity. So I find this number that the growth in this sector, in the whole manufacturing sector, for this period was 2.07%. Uh, uh, and when I decompose it, which is the next two comp uh, uh, columns, which is uh, average and reallocation, I find the change in allocation is marginal, which is like minus 0.6%, but it's almost constant. But the reallocation has like largely picked up. So that basically means that the more productive plants were able to expand, and the least productive plants were able to contract, contract their production processes, and hence there was positive market share reallocation. So this is at an aggregate level, manufacturing level. 
this is a simple graph it just shows the trends that uh, most of the aggregate productivity in this large manufacturing plants has been driven by market share reallocations is what i find in the numbers now the next is i see okay what happened to different industries when i classify uh, aggregate level at a two digit industry level uh, sorry uh, yes these are the various uh, industries uh, a couple of industries you might just see missing uh, i just removed them i have those numbers i'll just remove them to have a better view of the important industries so tobacco and wood and uh, stuff which was uh, had very small uh, shares in the total output i just removed but i don't have those numbers so you might not have to feel worried uh, so the major uh, the, the big emerging trend from these numbers is where where is where are the high performers in the industry it is the capital intensive sectors which is uh, nic 30 and beyond uh, electrical machinery office computer machinery motor vehicles uh, well, so the large growth has emerged from for the capital intensive sectors and the relatively labor intensive sectors you know such as food products textiles wearing apparel the growth has been marginal now let's see what caused this growth again there is a, a uh, if, if i can just sum this up prachi the capital intensive industries have experienced greater productivity growth, growth is it in terms of market share allocation yes. that's what you're concluding yes right? yes compared with the more labor intensive yes yes this okay way. so then i could move to thank you sure. i don't have to summarize this slide anymore so i'll move to the next slide so what i do is here uh, i decomp i split these industries based on their factor intensities and i see that okay factor intensity is basically which sort of factor are you using more intensively in your product whether you are a more labor intensive industry or you are a more capital intensive industry or uh, technology intensive or human capital so you might want to see only the sorry the last column here which is interesting there is one outlier which is a negative minus 2.43 and which corresponds to the labor intensive sector and the best performer is the technology intensive which is, has a very high reallocation and very high aggregate productivity growth so what's wrong with the labor industry one 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 would might want to think uh if you recall our decomposition formula it was basically that if uh if i'm a plant which has a productivity level lesser than the industry average and still i'm holding on to a share which is greater than the industry average because i'm not able to exit i don't want to exit i'm just holding i'm sitting there then this term will be negative and if there are plants which are sort of increasing their productivity shares but they they do not want to increase their uh, out uh, uh, manufacture share and manufacturing output because they think that okay if i increase my output too much i might have to employ probably more labor and sort of there there, there could be some sort of uh, thing that is worrying me and i don't want to expand that so th there is a uh, this dynamism of best firms expanding and le le worst firms contracting is sort of missing in the labor intensive sector and what could be the reason for it uh the most common and uh, possible reason that comes to our mind is labor market rigidities that uh, i do not want to fire i do not do not want to change my market share because you know I, if i have to fire it's a very dif difficult process in india uh so it's indicative of there is some some sort of rigidity in the market which is not letting this dynamics happen but other industries are not facing that uh, that rigidity so much so whether it was labor uh, whether it is uh, uh, labor market rigidities is what we'll test econometrically in the next step but this descriptive steps give us an idea that okay there is something wrong and let's figure out what what is it that is not happening right in this sector um uh, this is a aggregate productivity decomposition at the state level so the blue ones are the high performers so you see maharashtra gujarat andhra pradesh also madhya pradesh here uh, and karnataka is the high performers again the contribution of market share reallocations has been very high average productivity is almost stagnant or not not that great uh, for uh, bengal's not too bad <laughs> yes <laughs> essentially the I, I large manufacturing comfort. plants <laughs> Yeah, yes it's, it's i think it's because of the large manufacturing plants yes haryana is negative it's also odd. haryana is positive huh? haryana Har is isn't it minus 4.13 reallocation sorry ha reallocation is negative yes mm-hmm. yes exactly and i don't know why is it such big negative uh, this would be loved by the bjp government <laughs> whatever you are showing here gujarat madhya pradesh maharashtra they would like to publish Andhra. good for isas as well <laughs> let me go it so uh, 
so okay we move to the next slide so right now i'll just summarize the descriptive findings before we go into the econometrics so we find that there okay yes there is aggregate productivity growth of the overall manufacturing it grew at an annual rate of 2.07% the growth has been largely driven by market share reallocation so there were market share reallocations uh, across sectors and uh, except uh, labor intensive and growth is high in capital intensive sectors and low in labor intensive sectors and the best performing states were maharashtra gujarat karnataka ap and mp uh, so the next question is okay so we find evidence of market share reallocations that generated aggregate productivity but did trade cause these market share reallocations so that is where econometrics come into picture and we say okay let's perform a regression analysis and see whether changes in trade openness in, in, in indian economy significantly impacted these market share reallocation so that is the question that we want to ask here so that gets me to the second last slide of the presentation so the hypothesis that trade liberalization led to market share reallocations towards more productive plants so what do we do is uh, the regression analysis the dependent variable is the market share reallocations in industry and the explanatory variables are a couple of variables that uh, uh, i use i'll discuss a few which are uh, in this slide first is um, the trade liberalization which is uh, i measure it using output tariffs and uh, which is basically the tariffs that uh, you're facing on imports and also uh, a proxy for output tariffs or another variable to measure production is uh, effective rate of production which not only measures how much uh, producers are facing uh, tariffs on outputs that they are importing uh, final goods that they are importing but also but on the one small clarification the reallocation is something that you have already computed yes and now you are trying to figure out why that reallocation is what it is exactly right? so, so it there is are these uh, three uh, yeah. determinants that you have so my dependent Victor. variable is this okay. for each state industry right fight code it okay so <coughs> i ask uh, so how do i measure trade liberalization that's so one is output tariffs which is tariffs on final goods and another is uh, i also use erp effective rates of protection which is a uh, um, weighted uh, index of tariffs on final goods as well as tariffs on intermediate goods so it gives you a better idea of how much the overall protection the industry was facing then uh, i also use factor intensity dummies which is basically whether you are a labor intensive sector or a capital intensive sector or other and see what is the impact uh, what is it and the state level uh, level variables that i discuss here are three in number one is it measures the uh, uh, sort of phys uh, uh, physical infrastructure or not per se but it's basically the electricity availability in the state so now imagine that there is a plant which is uh, has increased its productivity and wants to expand but there is no electricity it doesn't get additional electricity uh, supply or there is a power uh, uh, power cuts in the state so it's not able to run the uh, industry uh, factory for longer hours which it wants to do because it has greater productivity so that dy dynamism of more productive plants trying to expand will be restricted if you know i'm not given enough power to produce then second is industrial credit uh am i able to uh, if i want to expand i want to get, uh, get more credit and so that i can buy new machines and, uh, and produce more but if i'm not able to get industrial credits or it's difficult to get one i will probably st stay shorter even if i have a positive productivity and the third is uh, variable that i use is labor market rigidity so i use two variables here uh one is uh, how many locks in uh, uh how many conflicts happened in the state which is measured by the number of uh, strikes and lockouts in the state uh, in a given year so the greater number of strikes and lockouts in the state by the workers that means there is a lot of rigidity uh, a lot of friction labor market frictions and uh, the dy dynamism which uh, manufacturing plants would like to uh, 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 enjoy uh, will not move in the same direction and the second is uh, i use uh, this dummy variable of labor flexibility using some indices which has been created by uh, rana hasan and kumar uh, and i see that okay states with uh, yes 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 the 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 it's so there are a lot of classification yes but uh, there is a, a new uh, uh, so there is an uh, uh, i don't i forget i've forgotten the first name but there is the second name uh, the first is gupta so Gup Gupta Gupta Hasan and Kumar okay yes it's a recent study they have re, uh, classified the state so i use this dummy flexible one non flexible uh, not flexible zero and see okay what is the change so uh, what do we expect uh, uh, we expect that output uh, tariffs when tariffs fall when production falls market share reallocations should rise so there is a negative impact falling in output tariffs le leading to increase in uh, uh, market share reallocations 
So the, the e coefficient that we expect is negative, and we also get a negative and very significant coefficient in the regression results. It controls for various state and uh, year dummies and uh, other sort of controls, uh, and this uh, finding is robust to different uh, specifications. Similarly, ERP, when effective rate of protection in sectors was falling, it led to positive impact. It's a very uh, uh, negative and very significant coefficient that we get. Labor-intensive dummy, uh, which basically means that, uh, yes, I'm operating in a labor-intensive sector, so my dummy is one. If my dummy is one, I have a negative coefficient. That means that I'm performing lesser than the others. So it's a negative significance. So econometrically, it says that, okay, labor-intensive sectors were not performing well. Uh, they were not able to increase their market share reallocations. Or if you are in a, in a, in a labor-intensive sector, you had lesser market share reallocations compared to the others. Electricity availability, if a uh, plant was located in a state with greater electricity by availability, uh, the impact was positive. Similarly, better credit availability, the impact is positive. Uh, if you have more uh, labor market frictions, that is, the nine days lost in strikes and workouts is very high, then market share reallocations were lesser. They impacted negatively. And uh, a proxy for this was, okay, labor flexibility dummy. If I'm flexible state, do I have, mar uh, have market greater market share reallocations? The answer is yes and significant. So this is the overall finding of the study that says that, uh, yes, trade did impact productivity growth. And these are, they were also influenced by the state level factors that were uh, uh, influencing these production houses. And uh, 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 plants that were located in states with not so flexible labor markets were sort of not able to uh, use that dynamism where, to their advantage. So the key findings of this study is that uh, first is, yes, uh, there was aggregate productivity growth. Yes, it was caused by market share reallocations. Gains were higher for capital intensive sectors. Uh, uh, and then th uh, the question that we asked was, did trade impact uh, market share reallocations? The answer is yes, trade led to rise in market share reallocations. And the gains were higher in states that had better business environment. So with this. <laughs> with this, it's a thank you, is it? <laughs> yes, okay. that's the next Thank slide. you, thank you. So we are now going to resume grilling mm -hmm. you again, right? Okay, I'm ready. Yeah, please, whosoever wants to. Uh, that the uh, yes, yes. So the market share is being allocated to the more productive firms. So you have something that when you're decomposing productivity changes, something that's average productivity and then mm -hmm. market share. Yes. Um, how do you do you blend them into the environment? So average productivity. Uh, so there is this industry. Uh, Econometric. It's just mathematical of adding and subtracting, uh, say, common terms from the. Right. Yeah. Okay, where is it? Uh, so, the intuition behind this uh, thing was because I basically wanted to see what was uh, the differences uh, between productivity and the relative market shares. Right? So I wanted to have a decomposition which says that what is the correlation, a number that correlates productivity uh, uh, difference with average productivity and market uh, market share. Yes, Pantla. So you expect um, a lagged relationship here, right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, so yeah, so the tariff data that I use is a lag tariff data. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. No, not for the tariff, but mm -hmm. the market share itself. Mm -hmm. The firm becomes more competitive. Yes. Producing equally good mm -hmm. bread mm -hmm. uh, as, as the next bakery, but uh, they become more efficient. And yes, yes. Making equipment and economies of scale, so but it'll take a. Take some time, the next year. Huge, right. But, uh, yes. So this number, exactly. So actually, the change in this number is market share reallocation. If I see a static one year number, then I can't say that there is market share reallocation. But if I see right. two years data, if this number is increasing, then there is market share reallocation. No, no, but I don't use that rolling average. I just use this cha change, okay. this correlation, and then I say, okay, is this correlation moving positive, and what is happening to the correlation at the tra trade side? So, sort of that. Prachi, I. Uh, I have a couple of uh, sort of thoughts, comments in which of it. Dr. Churi, you want to step down? You know, uh, 
first on the methodology side mm -hmm. see this uh, cop douglas production function in one of my earliest works was on cop douglas production function now i have a problem with this specification simply because mm -hmm. i think it's too restrictive a uh, functional category for True. estimating productivity you have the constant elasticity of substitution mm -hmm. you're assuming linearity of scales and you really don't have much option True. other than the logarithmic transformation and then you tend to box your data and parameters according to the function rather than going it the other way around yeah mm -hmm. yes so uh, i mean this is in no way taking away anything from what you have done but i would tend to look at the estimation results coming out of a uh, cd function a l with a little bit of circumspection but mm -hmm. that does not mean that there is any dilution of rigor or effort or on your part i mm -hmm. think you have stuck to the literature and you have gone ahead on that so that's one but my f more fundamental thought is that if i go back to your research question mm -hmm. right you're trying to analyze what is the impact of trade liberalization mm -hmm. on manufacturing productivity and as you uh, point out that at the plant level itself there is no way of judging whether these plants are directly engaged yeah. in trade. Yes. You see, uh, th th that is a limitation of the con concept of the plant itself. Even if we call a plant by some other name, mm -hmm. even if we call it a factory, it's actually the industry which is engaging. Yes. Right? So what you do, and as we all would have done, mm -hmm. is that when you come to the estimation, you take the trade variable and study its impact at the industry level. Yes, yes. This industry level uh, number that you have got is a bottom up summation of the plant level. Yes. Right? The problem is that what is true at the industry level mm -hmm. might not be true at the plant level. I mean, that's a gap that you will have to live with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because this is where your. Uh, results are conditioned by what the ASI census sector is. Exactly, yes. yes. Right? So the problem in that case is that you will have an issue in generalizing mm -hmm. the results mm -hmm. across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, say for example, even when you look at uh, factors like output tariffs mm -hmm. or effective rate of production, both are very different by the way. Yeah. I mean, so and you try to correlate their impact on what is happening at the factory level it's actually a bit of a tall order. I mean, I, I do understand the sincerity and rigor that you have put in, and I accept your results at the industry level. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure whether the industry level results can be extended to the plant level. That, um, I mean, that's a little bit of a, uh, you know, I would say a fundamental uh, issue, that, if you can call it an issue or anything mm -hmm. like that, I have with this mm -hmm. construct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you like to respond to that? Yes, yes, definitely. So I'll respond to the second question sure, sure. first. Mm. Um, uh, so I agree with your uh, opinion that you know I'm measuring something at a plant level and then correlating mm. it with industry level statistics and trying to find a direction. I, but I think that is m a more important problem in my second level of analysis, which is disaggregate level. Mm. In this, okay. if you see my dependent variable is an industry level variable, which is P I T. I is the industry. Right. So it is summation across plants. So this is sort of at the industry level the the dependent variable here is at the industry level okay but the point is valid definitely for my disaggregate level analysis when i see each plant and then which industry it is operating in so that sort of link is definitely so generalization cannot be made for the for the study overall and uh, coming to the uh, estimation of the cop douglas production function i totally agree and in fact when i was presenting my work in initial studies i, I got a lot of criticism that why just cop douglas you know we don't like cop douglas so i said okay let me just estimate a translog production function also and see what is the results uh, so i do mention the uh, the, uh, the results in the paper in the appendix that the results are the same like the productivity uh, estimates uh, the numbers might be different but the direction is same and the causal effect is the same so you can be slightly more sure that it is uh, the functional form is probably not affecting your results is is what have sort of done so yes anything else dipinder any other thoughts observations no, no, I can't just have a question, but that's fine. No, yes please
I think it's a trivial point about uh, the states. Uh, you, you're trying to figure out which states of uh, the firms would uh, perform better, and you've got these indicators which mm -hmm. the states. Um, I was wondering what motivated the choice. Labor market can perfectly understand there yes. are significant observed differences, and you can, the various proxies that you can use right. as well. Um, and I was lost, and you could uh, uh, normalize that. Why the other variables, is it? Credit, uh, yes. This is very often the corporate headquarters would be maybe located in another jurisdiction, another state, the uh, factory may be completely elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, it's, it's, it's more of a national level, right? Uh, if you're looking, I mean, it differs radically across It could be size. true, 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 true. It's very different for a small yeah. size. Yeah, um, As opposed to some, somebody who's gone can, uh, uh, public, then the country or the world is there. Yes. Playing arena. True, true. Okay. Um, likewise, yeah, for electricity, I'm not sure how much of a variation it has per year because, given the dismal situation, most firms tend to have captive sources and whether it's an energy intensive sector. That's a bit nitpicking, I mean. I, I see. That, I mean, you can probably okay. so to get it uh, at, at uh, the, you know, the energy intensity. Uh, the main point was uh, it might be worthwhile in order to strengthen your work. Uh, look for other indicators which you know, would give you a more robust uh, idea of how these factors affect yep. performances across. Uh, uh, like? Uh, <laughs> offhand. I, I, I haven't really seen the I entire see. cottage industry now today of uh, uh, these. Uh, and there's some of the firm that uh, state level also. Mm -hmm. Studies that are looking at uh, differences in practices across states. Just put, uh, and it's um, not necessarily yeah. infra level. Tupelo right. was done, she's done some work with a couple of Yes, Kandil, Amit Kandilwal and Tupelo. Yeah. Just to yeah. add to what Dipinder is mentioning, I think one of the things that could be of great interest to me is to look at the plant size. Uh -huh. If there's a way of distinguishing this. And Sorry? the plant size. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that, that would have a bearing on productivity, I think. Yes. And also at some stage, I'd like to know from you in a little bit more detail that when you came to this larger conclusion of capital intensive industries being more productive and then you move on to a distinction between ones which are more technology intensive mm -hmm. and the ones which are more human capital intensive. Yes. I'm, I'm a little doubtful about this fine distinction. I mean, say for example, if you look at uh, uh, an industry like automobiles, for example, yeah. uh, I would be a little skeptical in clubbing it entirely as a technology intensive industry because I think true, both true. come in but, together. But uh, the classification right? is not at the two digit level, it's at the three digit level. Yeah, that, yeah that's true. a problem with, uh, this is NIC 87, is it? No, this is 98. Anyway, mm. I think uh, let's put it here that uh, after after today you shouldn't have any fears about your defense. <laughs> I think we have we have made you strong enough and tough enough to take on the defense, and Thank we you. hope to hear from you very soon about uh, a successful defense. But before before we call it a day, I think uh, yeah, Dr. Just Chaudhry. One point. Yes, mm -hmm. please. Very very general. I mean, if plant and, and industry is interchangeable, sure. as you say. But if there is no evidence uh, that uh, the plant behavior at plant level is any different from the extrapolation that she has in general, right. does it affect her thesis? I mean, no, it does doesn't. It doesn't. Of, of no, no. It, uh, you're right. It, it certainly doesn't. And uh, if anybody thinks that it does, now you know what to tell them. Right? I think. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The onus, is, onus of proof is on the other side. But since my other colleagues are here and we are fortunate to have everybody from the uh, trade and economics program as well as uh, very senior colleagues like Dr. Chaudhary who know a lot about trade. Uh, we from ISAS are keen on having a paper from you on this. Mm -hmm but uh, maybe not exactly in this form because there are two complications in that. It's One already is already passed. I mean, you're here. It's not, no, it, so it is in, in the review. So no, that's you, what you'd be having plans to take this to a journal or somewhere, yes, yes, right? Yes. And we would want a little less technical, mm -hmm. more policy-focused paper from you. Okay. But what I want at this, yeah. 
what I what I would want at this point in time is a commitment from you that you will give us a paper. Okay. Because uh, that's something that we would be happy to go back with, and I'm sure you will, right? Yes. yes I'm indeed. assuming the commitment. Indeed, I will be. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Prashi, and uh, please keep this conversation going. Mm -hmm. uh, now that you're in Singapore, we'll be happy to look forward to engaging more with you. Uh, don't leave immediately. There's some tea and coffee that you must have, okay. and a gift for you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank Take you. care and uh, we wish you all the best for your defense. Thank you. And congratulations on this work. And do keep in touch. Thank you.